All right, you may be seated. And uh, thank you so much for being out today. And uh, who is loving the weather the past few days? Yes, there's two or three of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, it's been crazy. My parents live in Lancaster and uh, in Wrightwood, just about 45 minutes from them. I believe they got somewhere close to six feet of snow. Just to kind of give you a gauge, I'm six foot tall, okay? And uh, we were talking about that with the kids yesterday, and they're like, well, Daddy, if we were there, would you be carrying us on your shoulders so that we wouldn't be in the snow? And I said, well, yes, but I wouldn't be in the snow, okay? Six feet of snow, I don't really feel like walking through that. Uh, but there's been a lot of snow. I think Lake Arrowhead got somewhere close to three feet of snow as well. And, uh, and so there's been a lot. We got some hail. Wow, we missed out. I wanted to see some snow, you know. I'm from Washington State, and, and western Washington is, is a pretty mild climate. It's moderate, and so but we get snow, you know, about once a year for about three days or so, and it's enough to say there's snow, you know, take a snow day from school, go sledding down some hills, and then it's gone, you know, and it's, it's a great opportunity for us. You don't have to worry about too much. But here I thought we might get something. It might be a little. Did anybody get snow where you live? Anybody at all? Wow, you got snow? No way. Anybody else? Bear, hey, hey, snow is snow. Okay, we don't mess with that. When you see the white stuff coming down, you got snow. And uh, but that was uh, that was so cool. The past few days, it's obviously been a little wet. And uh, we drove to LA yesterday, and it was pouring down on the freeway. And Southern Californians, uh, you know, rain coming from the sky is kind of scary when they're driving on the freeway. And uh, it's a whole new adventure when you got the windshield wipers going super fast and they're trying to draw, uh, you know, kind of dodge each raindrop. Uh, but uh, we got we got through it and made it work. Well, I'm excited about this weekend, and thanks for braving the elements. I know today is a little reprieve uh, from the weather, and it's supposed to pick back up as far as rain goes tomorrow. Uh, but this is a special weekend for us. This is Financial Health Weekend. You might say, Pastor, why is this on the calendar? Well, I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that I'm a wise steward of what God has given me. And we want to know some biblical principles from the Word of God that can help us practically apply those principles into our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm thankful for Nate Skelly coming out here. He lives in Florida, and he'll tell you that in a moment, flying out yesterday and being with us. And he's going to speak on this. He's a financial advisor, and uh, he desires to be a blessing to pastors and churches all around the world. And I'm excited for him to be with us. We had a great Sunday school hour, the life group there, where he talked about some principles from Solomon that we can learn from. I'm looking forward to this one. And then right after this, we're going to have a potluck and then a shorter session right after that. And so please grab your Bibles, grab your notes. You should have them there in your bulletin. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's pray real quick. And after I pray, Nate's going to come up and he's going to speak to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for being such a great God. Thank you, Lord, that your, your word is applicable to our lives today. Thank you, Lord, that we have someone like Nate that can travel around and really help and engage churches, Lord, into making sure we're being wise with the finances that you've given us. Lord, the term money can often be a trigger in homes, and it could be it could be something that creates a lot of uh, turmoil, Lord, maybe due to poor financial management or, or things that come in. And I pray, Lord, that as we listen to your word this morning and as we hear some practical applications of that that we can take into our daily lives, that, Lord, we would apply it, not just hear it, but do something about it and be wise stewards of what you have given us. Thank you, Lord, so much for just the blessings that you showed to us. We truly are blessed people. Bless this service, Lord, and we'll trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Nate, come on. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning again to those that were in the Life Group Hour. Good morning to those of you who are just here for this hour. And, man, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, Matt, for the invitation to be here. Um, where is Nathan? Is Nathan in here? He's with you. He's with you. Okay. I got to uh, have some In-N-Out Burger with Nathan yesterday. I got to chat with him. That was really cool. I've been looking forward to being here. So this is uh, this is cool for me coming back to Southern California. My wife actually grew up right here, this area, Riverside, Marina Valley. Like, so she's from here. And we met at college uh, in Lancaster. And so I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a very different world in Pittsburgh. But, you know, and being here for college, I got to see a little bit of the the Los Angeles area and some of the more iconic things, but it's, it's been a while since I've been back to this area. I told my wife, I was like, is there anything that you want me to like bring back for you? Like I'm going back to like where you grew up. She's like, if you could bring back in and out burger, but I think by the time you get back, it's not gonna be any good anymore. So, um, but my, my wife Charity and I have been married for 11 years. Now we've got three kids. Jaden is seven, Judah is five, and Juliet is four. 
and we live in Pensacola, Florida. I was selling the, the, the Life Group Hour. That's the panhandle of Florida, all the way at the end, and it is basically Alabama, even though we are technically in Florida. But we're having a great time there. Matt, did you want me to say something about um, Israel or say something about that later? Well, you can say something now, but we'll talk about it a little bit later, too. Okay, I'll save it for later, Matt. Okay. I, I do want to... I, I, I have to say something about Israel. I'm really glad that you guys are going to have uh, the opportunity to do that. So I'll say that later. Let me just say this before I jump into the message here. Um, I hope you know, you'll stick around. I don't know if your plan was coming in this morning that you were planning to stick around for lunch and, and the session afterwards. I hope you will because we're going to get real practical in that session. I don't know about you, but in these last 12 to 18 months, 24 months, They've been kind of crazy. I don't know if you've noticed. You've probably not noticed because you're so well off. But uh, when you go to the grocery store, things are a little bit more expensive than they were a couple of years ago. I mean, I'm sure when you go to the gas station, you probably just fill up and you don't even look at the gas gauge. But the gas prices are a little bit higher than they used to be. And I, I don't know about you, but I think many of us are feeling some of those financial pressures. Um, maybe you were checking your 401k here recently and you opened it up and then you wish that you didn't look at it. Um, all of us face financial pressures at different seasons in our life. And the Bible has immense wisdom and principles about money and how it relates to our lives. Sometimes we can compartmentalize in our American mindset. We think, yeah, I need to go to church and look to God's word for my marriage or for my parenting or for my you know individual relationship with the Lord. But money... Well, money's over there. I kind of I handle the money stuff, and that doesn't really overlap. And folks, God's word gives us the roadmap. It gives us all the wisdom we need for all the areas of our life. And if you look at Scripture, what you'll find is there are over two thousand verses that speak about money and material possessions. Remember, in the Bible, it wasn't always currency. Many times, wealth was measured in land or in livestock or in you know uh, precious jewels or gold or these types of things. But the Bible has a lot to say on money. When you read the Gospels, Jesus spoke more often about money than he did things like heaven or hell or prayer or faith. Not because money is more important than those things, but Jesus understood that money often is the connection to what really is going on. That's why Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so I hope in this message this morning. We're going to draw out some principles from God's Word, but I hope you'll be able to, to join us for that afternoon session because we're going to get real practical and talk about every day in our personal finances, what are some things that we can we can do to equip ourselves to be better 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 money managers for the Lord. Because by the way, that's what we are. We're managers. We're stewards. That's the word the Bible uses. Uh, God is the owner of all of it. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He is the creator. Everything that we live and enjoy. It all comes from God, but he's placed it into our hands. And we have a responsibility to manage those resources, just like we manage our time, just like we manage any talents or abilities we have. We also manage our money, and we're accountable to God for you know, how we use that resource. So, in this hour, uh, in, in this message time, I want to spend a few minutes with you, and I, I want to speak to you on this topic of treasure hunt. Treasure hunt, that's what I've entitled this message. You ever been on a treasure hunt before? Uh, growing up, we didn't, as kids, we didn't do trick or treat. We, we lived in this neighborhood in Pittsburgh. It was kind of, I say Pittsburgh, but it was really kind of out in the suburbs. And our, our neighborhood had hardly any homes in it. There were hardly any kids in our neighborhood. Nobody went around and did the trick or treat thing. Um, so instead, my parents, they had this tradition where we would do a treasure hunt every year. And we really looked forward to it as kids. It was like a lot of fun for us. So. Uh, my mom and my dad would say, okay, time to go. We, they, we'd all have to go to one room while they set it all up for us. So we'd wait there for a little while, and then it would be time to come out, and then they would hand us the first clue. And the clue had something, you know, we'd, we'd grab the clue, and we'd read it, and then the, it would basically, we'd have to figure out the clue. Oh, we have to go to the laundry room. We'd all run to the laundry room, and we'd search high and low until we found the next clue. And then, oh, we have to go to the garage. We have to go to mom and dad's bedroom. We have to go to the doghouse. We'd like you know, we'd just take us all over our house and our yard. And then eventually, the last clue led to the treasure. And the treasure was, of course, a big bag of candy. And we you know, had a good time and we enjoyed that. That was something we looked forward to every single year, our treasure hunt. But you know what I found about treasure hunts is they're still exciting even as an adult. 
you don't really outgrow the excitement and the enthusiasm around a treasure hunt, okay? Um, think about how many stories, how many movies and shows and books have as their theme treasure hunt. You ever thought about that before? National Treasure, the Treasure Island book, Count of Monte Cristo, uh, uh, the Indiana Jones movies. The, there's, there's literally shows on the Discovery Channel and the History Channel right now that are about people current day, like in modern day, looking for buried treasure from this pirate. Or from, still kind of cool, right? I think all of us, if, if we were to actually be able to partake in a real treasure hunt, be a very exciting thing, and we'd all be very happy to engage in that, especially if we knew that there was a very real treasure at the end of that quest. Well, there is a famous treasure story. Actually, we find it in the Bible. It's a very short story. It was told by none other than Jesus himself. Maybe you were already thinking this as I was talking about treasure hunt. Maybe this passage came to mind. Jesus taught a parable about a lost treasure. We're going to look at that parable today. It's very short. So literally one verse, but man, what a verse it is. And the truth that Jesus conveys in this powerful is so transformational that if you will grab a hold of that this morning, it will fundamentally change the way that you view money, riches, and eternity. I want you to take your Bible. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to get there in just a moment. Matthew 13. Jesus taught many parables. Parables are stories that have a spiritual truth. They're not real accounts. They're, mainly, they're merely a story that is meant to illustrate a, a spiritual truth. Very often Jesus used parables because it helped people connect very important spiritual concepts to an analogy of something that they already understood. And what would, would help his, uh, his listeners to understand is many times the people that wanted to understand Jesus, the people that wanted to follow him, when he gave them parables, it helped them to understand. But the people that hated Jesus, the people that wanted to discredit them, the parables would obscure the truth from them. And so it was very interesting how Jesus used parables to help his followers and his true seekers to see the truth, meanwhile hiding it from those who didn't actually want to sincerely seek the truth. We find in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus is teaching a series of parables. He is in Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee. If you go to Israel, you will go there to Capernaum. You'll see this place. It's where Jesus spent a lot of time ministering and teaching. He's got a big crowd gathered, and he's teaching these parables. And he's teaching them about the sower and the seed. And all of these parables have to do with one theme, and the theme is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And when you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew in particular focuses in on this topic, this theme, kingdom of heaven. You find the word kingdom come up at least 30 times in the book of Matthew. Remember, each Gospel account... It's a little bit of a different angle. Each writer takes a little bit of a different viewpoint on the life of Jesus, and they include certain things that maybe other writers don't. Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience. And he's very careful to key in on the kingdom of heaven because the Jewish people were looking for a kingdom. But not a kingdom of heaven. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. See, they had read, they were very careful to study their Old Testament scriptures, and they knew that the Bible said that one day the Messiah will rule and reign from Jerusalem. And he will establish a kingdom, and there will be peace and prosperity. They will have, there will be power. And they were longing for that day because at the time that Jesus lived and ministered, the Roman Empire ruled. And the Roman Empire was a grand empire, but they were fierce. They crushed their enemies, and they ruled with an iron fist. And so they ruled over the land of Israel, and the Jewish people longed for a day when their Messiah, when their king would set up his kingdom and rule and reign with power and peace and prosperity, and they thought maybe Jesus is the God. He's going to give us the earthly kingdom. And Jesus had to, had to teach them, listen, I'm here to tell you about a better kingdom. Not an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom. And so as he teaches these parables, he's trying to explain to them what is the kingdom of heaven. And he says it's like a sower throwing field, or throwing seed out on his field. It's like a mustard seed that's very, very small that grows into this enormous tree. It's like leaven that is placed inside the bread and you don't really see it, but it causes the whole loaf to rise. And he's teaching all these parables. 
Well, at the end of the day, the crowd goes home and the disciples come to Jesus and they're like, well, those are really interesting stories, Jesus, but we don't know what they mean. Can you explain them to us? And Jesus says, well, the sower and the seed, the, the seed is, is God's word. It's the gospel. And, and when the gospel is given out, sometimes it's received and God does a miraculous work and starts a new life. But other times it's rejected for various reasons. And he's teaching them, here's what this means. And then, at the end of that explanation, we come to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44. And I want you to see it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Jesus gives them another parable to illustrate what the kingdom of heaven is like. Let's, know, let's, let's read it. Here, Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. There it is. There's the parable. Short, sweet, to the point. Can you imagine how his audience, his disciples, would have pictured that story going down? No doubt in their mind they had a picture of how this story would unfold. They understood the culture of the day. They knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. Let's imagine a man who's walking home at the end of the day, and he's walking through a field, and he, he stumbles, and he trips, and he looks back expecting to see some rocks protruding from the ground. This is very rocky soil there in that part of the, of the world. But instead of seeing rocks, he actually sees something wooden protruding out of the ground. He thinks, what is this? And on further inspection, he realizes there's a box here. And he starts to dig with his hands, and pretty soon he unearths that box, and he looks around, and nobody's... Nobody sees, nobody's witnessed this. He opens the box and it is full of gold, and silver, and coins, and jewelry. It's more money than he's ever seen. This kind of money would set him and his family up for life. And very quickly it dawns on him, I, I can't take the money though. Because the law says that money belongs to whoever the owner of that field is. And if he were to take that money and it would be discovered where it came from, he would have to forfeit all that money. So very quickly he hides it. He puts it back in the ground, he covers it back up with dirt, tries to disguise the area so nobody else will see, maybe moves a rock over the place so he remembers exactly where that box is, then he goes home. And that night at dinner, his wife's trying to talk to him, his kids are playing, and he is just in his own world. He just cannot stop thinking about this treasure, how do I get that treasure? And then all of a sudden it dawns on him, I know what I have to do. If I buy the field, then I'm in the clear. It's mine. Nobody will have any other legal claim to it, and I can enjoy that treasure. But first, I have to go buy the field. So he wakes up that next morning. First thing, he jets off to find out who owns that field. And the people in the village say, oh, yeah, it's uh, uh, Jacob over there on the other side of town. That's his field. And so he goes to this man. And he says, hey, I, I would be interested in that field that you own. You know, the one with the olive trees up there at the top of the hill. And it, I just walk that way every I just always thought there would be a great plot of land. Would you be willing to sell it to me? And the man thinks, well, I wasn't planning to sell it, but I suppose maybe I'll let it go for 300 shekels. And, yeah, I think so. 300 shekels, okay. Well, um, let me get back to you on that. And he heads home and he begins to add up in his mind, okay, well, I, I know I have this much in savings. Well, if we sold the house, then I think we get this for it. And maybe if we sold the livestock. And he gets home and he says, honey, I'm not crazy. I'm not lost it. But we're selling the house. I want you to find every penny that we've got. I'm going to go to town. I'm going to sell the donkey. I'm going to sell the goats. Any extra clothes, any jewelry, we're selling it all. And believe me, I know what we're doing. And as he sells all of his possessions and puts the for sale side in the yard and liquidates all of his assets, he gets just enough money, just enough to have the 300 shekels. He goes back to the man and says, hey, I've got the money. Do we have a deal? The man says, we have a deal. And that agreement is finalized. And he goes home and he says, honey, kids, I just changed our lives. Come with me and see what I found. And for joy, he goes and unearths that treasure. Yeah, cool story, right? I guess that'd be kind of cool if that happened to you. You just happened to find some buried treasure and came into a lot of money all of a sudden. What's the point? What is Jesus getting at in this parable? The big idea is this, and I don't want you to miss this. The treasure of the kingdom of heaven is far greater 
than anything you could have in this life. That is what Jesus is teaching. The treasure of the kingdom of heaven is far more valuable than anything you could ever have in this life. I want us to notice, we're going to zoom in on three words in this parable that will help us to unlock fully the truth of what Jesus is teaching and help us to truly know what it means to say the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything we could ever have. The first word I want you to see is the word kingdom. If you have the notes, if you're taking notes, that's the first blank there. Number one, kingdom. Okay, let's look at the verse again. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Now, the kingdom of heaven, as opposed to what? Well, the kingdom of earth. What were the Jewish people, what were the audience that Jesus is speaking to, what kind of kingdom have they been looking for? What kind of kingdom do they desire? Well, an earthly kingdom. They want somebody to rule and reign from Jerusalem. They want somebody with might and power and army, somebody who will bring physical money and wealth to them. That's what they're, they're expecting. That's what they're seeking. And Jesus says, I want to tell you about a better kingdom, a heavenly kingdom. And what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's the place where God rules and reigns supreme. It's that perfect state of being that we were intended for. It's what God created us for. It's that place where there is no sickness, no death, no sin, where we enjoy perfect fellowship with the Lord. This is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, I want to teach you about that kingdom. And the question I would have for you this morning is this, which kingdom are you living for? Are you living for an earthly kingdom or are you living for a heavenly one? Now that's a tough question to answer. Are you living for an earthly kingdom or are you living for a heavenly one? Just about to say, well, hey, I, I, how, do, how do I know? Like, I mean, I have to live in the earthly kingdom, right? Like I have to go to work and I have to pay my bills and I have to eat and I have to sleep. And how do I know if I'm living for an earthly kingdom and not a heavenly one? Let me ask you some clarifying questions. First of all, what is it that you want most in life? Truly, what are you living for? Is it for the nice house? Is it for the fancy car? Is it for nice clothes or the latest tech? Is it to eat at the best restaurants? Is it to have a good, a good salary? Is it for the kids to go to a good school? Is your life's pursuit merely for earthly things? Now again, is there anything wrong with those things per se? No. Nothing wrong with money and wealth and trying to uh, make good financial decisions. But if that is your purpose in life, if that is your main goal, if that's what you're living for, then I would submit to you that you're living for an earthly kingdom. Here's probably a better clarifying question. What is it that stirs your emotions? What gets you riled up? Is it only things of this earth? Or is it eternal things, spiritual things? What moves you to anger? What moves you to sadness? What gets you excited? Is it only ever things of this earth? And, and, and please believe me, what I said, it, it's not wrong for us to be moved to emotion with earthly and everyday things, but if that's all that we ever care about, if that's the only thing that stirs our emotion and nothing about the Lord, nothing about eternity, nothing about our spiritual life ever moves our emotions, and that's a problem, and that would indicate to me that you're living more for an earthly kingdom than you are for a heavenly kingdom. Think about the life of Jesus. Was he ever stirred emotionally? Certainly. He was man. He was fully human, just like we are. He understood what it meant to be angry and to be sad and to be excited. Think about what made Jesus angry. Remember when he turned over the tables in the temple? Why was he angry? Because people were distracting and taking away from the worship and prayer of God. They were making it all about their, their, their business and, and their money. He said, get these things out of here. They should not be here. This is, this is my father's house. It should be a house of prayer. What moved, his, his, what moved him uh, emotionally when, when, when it came to his sadness? Do you remember that passage where Jesus stood on the Mount of Olives and looked over Jerusalem and he wept for the city? He said, I'm just so sad for Jerusalem because I wanted to gather you under my wing, but you resisted me. You, you would not. And he wept for the city of Jerusalem. 
Think about what made Jesus excited. Do you remember that Roman centurion that came to him and said, Lord, I want you to heal my servant. You don't even have to go to my house. Now. Just say the word, and I know that he'll be healed. Jesus said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Like, I am astounded by your faith that you have in me. Those were the things that moved Jesus emotionally. And I think in our own life, we have to ask ourselves, okay, what is it that stirs us? What stirs us to anger, to sadness, to excitement? Is it only ever the things of the Lord? Or do we care about heavenly things, spiritual things, eternal things? I have a picture here in the slides of a book that I read as a kid. It's one of my favorite books, this series. Maybe some of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia series written by C.S. Lewis. Wonderful. It's, they're written as children's books, but even as adults, they're great. Uh, they're, they're great stories. C.S. Lewis, a Christian author, a master at allegory. These stories are written about a fantasy land called Narnia, where there are mythical creatures. There are talking animals, as well as humans. And there's uh, centaurs, and there's unicorns, and there's all these different you know, magical creatures in this magical fantasy land. And, and these kids from from our world get magically transported to Narnia. And Aslan, the lion, is the picture of Jesus Christ. He is the true king of Narnia. And all of these stories are great pictures of themes of the Bible, love and redemption and sacrifice. The last book of the seven books is called The Last Battle, and it's a great allegory of Revelation and the end times. And as I read this book, and I've, I've, I've read it you know, as a kid and then rereading it later on, I was struck with how wonderful C.S. Lewis describes heaven in a children's book about a fantasy land. In, in the last battle, and for sake of time, I'm not going to try to bore you with a whole recap of the book, but essentially what happens is those Narnians that remain loyal to Aslan, the true king, have to fight a last battle against Aslan's enemies. And after that last battle, his followers are taken through a magical door into a new land. And what they find is as they pass through that new, that door, the old Narnia is ending, it's being destroyed, it's coming to an end. And as they walk through the door, they find themselves in Narnia. Except it's a better Narnia. And the way that C.S. Lewis describes it in the book, he says, it's almost like if you were to sit at a window overlooking the sea, or a beautiful green valley with a river running through it, through the mountains, and you were to take in that sight, but then turn to the other side of the room and see a mirror there, and see the reflection in the mirror of the scene that you were looking at outside, it would be the same, but yet it would lack a sense of realness. And what they come to find is as they step into Narnia, everything is more real, it's more vibrant, more colorful, that this is the real Narnia, and everything that they had encountered and experienced before was just like a reflection in a mirror. And at one point in the book, the unicorn says this, he says, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that sometimes, is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Come further up, come further in. And as they go further into this land, it just keeps getting better and better and more vibrant and more amazing. And they're just more and more overwhelmed by what the real Narnia is. And folks, I think that is such a beautiful picture of what heaven will be like someday. When we step into a place that we were meant to be, real existence, without all of the the pain and the suffering and the sin and the sickness and death and all the things that we experience here in this life, when all of that is passed away, we'll know what real living is like. And we'll look back at our time here on earth, that short window, and we'll say, yeah, that was like, it was like a reflection. It was like a bad imitation of what this place is. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, in that eternity, in that place, that we will spend forever and ever, what are we gonna really care about? Are we gonna look back with regret and say, man, I wish that I had lived my life more focused on this place instead of wasting all my time worried about the here and now and that, that place that is really just a, a cheap invitation of the real place. Do you see what I'm saying? When, when you think about the kingdom of heaven, we really allow that to permeate our thinking and understand what it truly means to live in perfect harmony 
with our Lord and Savior, all of the things of the earth start to melt into the background. So are you living for an earthly kingdom or a heavenly one? Second word I want you to see is the word treasure. Treasure. Let's see Matthew 13, 44 again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Treasure is valuable. Treasure is precious. A good treasure is worth seeking out. The kingdom of heaven, I want you to notice the statement, the kingdom of heaven is the greatest treasure you could ever find. The kingdom of heaven is the greatest treasure you could ever find. I mentioned at the beginning of the message there are a lot of treasure stories out there. Some real, some made up. And they're exciting, you know? They just kind of... It's nice to get kind of caught up in that, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool for me to be on a real treasure hunt or find some real treasure? And every now and then, real life does imitate the stories that we tell. About 30 years ago, there was a real-life treasure found in England. I think I have a picture of the guys who found it. Peter Watling, he's a farmer. I don't know if he is today, but was a farmer. He lost his hammer out in his field. I don't know what he was doing with the hammer out in the field, but he lost it. And his neighbor, Eric, was kind of an amateur, uh, I don't know what the, there's probably a term for it, but he, he had a metal detector. He liked to kind of take the metal detector out, just kind of amateur, and see if he could find it. So he said, hey, come on over, bring your metal detector, I gotta try to find this hammer. Well, while they're out there with the metal detector, they didn't find the hammer, but they did find some other stuff. Found an old coin, then they found a very old uh, piece of uh, silverware, and then pretty soon they started finding more coins and more silver. And before they realized that they had unearthed the remains of a Roman treasure chest with silverware and gold and silver and jewelry. And now it's on display at the museum. Unfortunately for Peter and Eric, they didn't have the same laws as there were in Jesus' time where it's finder's keeper if this is your land. Instead, the, 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 the stuff got taken to the museum. But they got a very generous uh, finder's fee for the treasure. So don't feel bad for Peter and Eric. They, they made out just, just fine at the end. If you were like Peter or Eric, and you had a buried treasure in your backyard, how long do you think it would take for you to go out and look for it? If you knew somewhere on your park property there is buried treasure, I don't think you'd stay for the potluck. I don't, know, no, I don't even know if you'd stay for the rest of this message. You'd be like, I'm going home. I'm going to go find a metal detector. I'm going to get a shovel. I'm going to search high and low until I find that treasure. Why? Because it's valuable to you. You place great value on a treasure. And the Bible teaches that the kingdom of heaven is the greatest treasure that you could ever find. Far more than gold or silver or money or any other earthly treasure. It is valuable. The problem is... We say we think it's valuable, but do we live as if it's valuable? I want you to notice Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, very famous passage. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Jesus says, Don't make your life about earthly treasure. And the reason is, is because it's fragile. It can get stolen, you know, things get rusty. Clothes, nice clothes, they get moth eaten, they go out of style. Everything that you can get your hands on in this life is very fragile and go away just like that. But by contrast, he says in verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So Jesus says, Don't make your life about earthly treasures, make your life about heavenly treasures. Now let's hold on for a second, because probably on your way to church today, you did not pass. A first bank of heaven. So where do we go to make these deposits in, or in heavenly riches? What does that mean? Well, the Bible is very clear is that when we are generous, when we give to God's work, we give to help others in need, that we are laying up treasure in heaven. And I don't know exactly, the Bible's not clear, what does that all look like? How does that exactly work in eternity? I'm not sure. I can't paint you an exact picture today. But I believe it because God's word says that it's true and that Jesus says the best way to spend your life, the best way to spend your resources and your attention is not for earthly riches, but for heavenly riches. And then he says this, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know why you invest in eternity? Because when you place your treasure, when you place your resources towards something, 
That's what you care about, right? And you know this to be true. You spent a lot of money on your house. You care about that house. You try to take good care of it. You buy a new car. You don't let people eat, okay? No drinks in the car, right? You take it to the car wash every week, and you're meticulous, and you do the wax, and, right? Because you care about it. Because I spend a lot of money on it. It's valuable to me. And the Bible says that when we invest in eternity, that's what we will care about. The greatest investment you could ever make is in God's kingdom. Far greater than Wall Street, far greater than any stock or any mutual fund, the greatest investment that you could ever make is in God's kingdom. So we, we saw the word kingdom, we saw the word treasure, and thirdly, and lastly this morning, I want you to see the word joy. Joy. Don't miss this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Why does this man have joy? Because he just made the trade of a lifetime. That's what you do. When you make a great trade, you have joy. Growing up, my mom, she, she would always cut coupons. She'd get the Sunday newspaper, comb through it, clip all the coupons. Have you ever seen that show, Extreme Couponing? Like those people, I mean, sorry if you're one of them, but that's, uh, that's extreme is right. Um, but man, I mean, she, she was great. Uh, I, I don't know if she, she does it much anymore, and probably now with, with paper coupons, it's, just, it's, it's probably not as big of a thing. But she'd go to the grocery store after like hours of prep, and she would get a haul. Like she would get like carts of groceries for you know 100 bucks, 150 bucks, and she'd come home and she'd be bringing all this food, putting it on the kitchen counter, and she'd be like, look at all the stuff I got. Here's this, and, da, da, da. and then I use this coupon, and then this extra coupon, and then there's 50%. And she's telling teenage boys, me and my brothers, who could not care less. All we care about is what did you get us, mom? We don't really care how much you spent on it. But she was excited. She was happy to tell somebody. Why? She got a great deal. She made a great trade. I'm a little bit reluctant to tell you this because as a Boston Red Sox fan, it kind of pains me to tell the story. But back in 1920, Probably the most lopsided trade in all of sports history went down. The Boston Red Sox had won three of the last five World Series, led by their star pitcher, Babe Ruth. Yes, he was a star pitcher before he became known as the great home run hitter. And they decided, you know what we should do? Let's trade away our best player to the New York Yankees, our hated rivals. Why they did this, I still do not know. But they did, and they traded Babe Ruth to the Yankees for a grand total of about $125,000. And back then, I know that's a little bit more money than, than it would be today, but I mean, anybody, you ask any historian, anybody that knows sports, they will tell you the Yankees got the better end of this deal because they went on to win seven more, they won seven American League pennants, they won four World Series, Babe Ruth went on to hit an unprecedented 60 home runs in a season, and he goes down as one of the greatest, if not the greatest baseball player of all time. Meanwhile, the Red Sox, would go another 86 years without winning a World Series. And the curse of the Bambino was started. The Yankees are very happy about that trade. Nobody says, yeah, but you guys had to pay $125,000, huh? No, they would do that again in a heartbeat because they got a roof. They are joyful about that trade. When you trade something, of small value for something of great value, it brings joy. I don't know if you've ever done this before. I've seen people play this game. It used to be an old youth group game, bigger and better. You'd start out the, the activity with make a thumbtack or a paper clip or some really small and significant thing, and you'd have to go and trade it for something bigger and better. You'd have to spend the entirety of that window of time and people would literally go to people's houses. They would just try to flag down people just walking the street like, hey, what can you trade me that's bigger or better for this? And sometimes people would come away with like some really cool stuff. Like they'd come back with a TV, a couch. Uh, I heard about one group, they even got a car. Now it wasn't a great car, it was like an old junkie car. But somebody gave them a car, like, you know, bigger and better. You make trades. What the Bible is teaching here is this man has joy because he traded something of very small value, earthly riches, for something of great value, the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. Here's the statement. I don't want you to miss this. If you lost everything, and I mean everything, but you gained the kingdom of heaven, you would have joy. 
If today you lost everything, but you knew Jesus Christ as your Savior and heaven would be your home, then you could have joy. Because it's so much better than anything you can have in this world. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Paul says, you know what I've learned in life? All of the things that I used to think were so important, the things I used to place such great value on, now, compared to Christ, compared to knowing him, they're nothing. I would part with them in a second. Have you found that treasure? I know this is a message and a weekend on finances, but and if you're in the room this morning and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, if you don't know that you would spend eternity with him in heaven, man, that's the best decision you could ever make. And I, I hope that you would talk to Pastor Matt about that today and make that decision. But, but I have to think that probably most of you in the room would say, hey, I, yeah, I, Jesus is my Savior. I believe heaven will be where I spend eternity. I believe that. So here's the question for us then. Which one are we living for? Are we living for an earthly kingdom or are we living for a heavenly one? Which kingdom? Earthly or heavenly? What do you treasure? If you've been transformed by the truth of the kingdom of heaven is far more valuable than anything that you could have in this life, and will you choose Joy. Will you choose to trade anything for the joy of the treasure of the kingdom of heaven? I'm going to close with this story. I have here a picture of a man. This is Charles uh, Charles Studd, uh, otherwise known as C.T. Studd. Maybe you've heard this story before, in case you haven't. He grew up in England back in the 1800s. His father's very wealthy, uh, and Charles was an excellent cricket player. So, you know, cricket, it's kind of like baseball with the, the flat bat and they have the bases. And I don't even know how it works. But he was really good at it. In fact, he was so good that by the time he got to college, people were like, he became a household name. Like, people have, have said of him that he was almost like the Michael Jordan of cricket of his day. Like, cricket was the most popular sport in England, and he was the most popular player. And, like, he was great. He was destined for great things. Came from a very wealthy family, very talented uh Athlete, promising career. He came to know Christ as a teenager. By the time he turned 24, he retired. Quit cricket. Gave up his career. And he and his family moved to China. And people asked him, they said, why are you doing that? He said, because God's called me to the mission field. There's people in this other part of the world that don't know about Jesus, and I want to share the gospel with them. And when he turned 25, he inherited a very hefty sum from his father, as the will had stipulated. And he took all of that money and he gave it away. And then after China, he moved to India. And after India, he moved to Africa. And he spent the rest of his life traveling to remote places, to remote peoples that had never heard the name of Jesus, and trying to share the gospel with them. And a lot of people would look at a life like that and say, that seems kind of dumb to me. Like, come on, man. Like, you got a lot of money. You got a great career. Don't give that up. Like, if you want to serve Jesus, serve Jesus. You know, go to church, tell people about him, use your platform, give a lot of money. But you don't have to go. You don't have to do it, right? Enjoy what you got here and kind of give a little bit to the Lord. But that wasn't what God had called C.T. Studd to do. And at the end of his life, he didn't sit down and say, oh, man, I was such an idiot. Why didn't, I, why didn't I continue my cricket career? Why didn't I take that money from my dad? Why didn't I just live a nice life in England? You know what he said? He said this, only when life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. What a great testimony of somebody who understood this parable, who truly discovered the treasure of the kingdom of heaven and said, I'm going to spend all eternity with Jesus. This life is just a little vapor. I'm here for a little bit of time, and then it's all gone. Earthly riches are fleeting, they're fragile, they can be taken away in a second. I'm not going to live for that stuff. Not going to live for fame, not going to live for wealth. I'm just going to live to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. And when it's all said and done, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I hope I would challenge you this morning to consider this parable and, and, and to be able to come to the place in your own life where you say, Nate, I believe that. I value and I treasure the kingdom of heaven 
above anything else. Let's have a word of prayer as we conclude our service this morning.